love this picture of you with a nail in your nose. That's just crazy. <laughs> so I was like, that's a kind of funny nose ring. Wait a minute. No, that's a nail in his nose. <laughs> I, I love that picture because it's, to me, it's the perfect headshot. Because when you first look at it, you're Let's like, the nail so in the happy. Head. this is a shit. Like, you know, it feels like a certain way. And then you look closer and you're like, what is... Yeah. That's, that's the face. <laughs> Why is he so happy? Right. You're I gonna... got it in there. <laughs> Mom, so, can you get this uh, yeah. out? Yeah, no. You know what's funny is that ever since I started doing like a lot of the sideshow stuff, uh, my mom and I would make jokes to each other. Yeah. Where I'd call her, you know, like now that I'm a fire eater, and I'd call her, and she said, like, I'm busy. Are you on fire? <laughs> and I'd say, well, yeah. And she'd go, okay, but, like, are you in danger? Okay? Like, there's a difference now. So that, that's always been, been an interesting Oh, yeah, one Mom. I'm mom. on the phone with you <laughs> on fire. <laughs> come, come save me. I'm fine. It can wait. Welcome to the Create Happy Now podcast, dedicated to helping you start your journey to discover true happiness. Join me, your host, Susan Blanton, weekly as we explore the transformation stories and words of wisdom from our Masters of Happiness with tips you can start applying today to create happy now. Remy Connor is internationally recognized for his expertise in magic, mentalism, and his distinct exploration of the unusual. From a young age, he delved deep into the intricacies of magic, merging techniques like psychology, sleight of hand, and misdirection to craft unforgettable experiences. Remy's magic has captivated audiences in over a dozen countries, from Russia to Italy, and he has showcased his skills in 48 U.S. states. Remy's expressive repertoire extends to entertaining celebrities with names like Spike Lee, P. Diddy, Holland Oates, T-Pain, and T.I. Each of his shows underscores his belief in the genuine essence of magic. In Remy's world, magic isn't just entertainment. It's an experience and a reality. Well, Remy, thank you so much for joining me today. And, you know, we have a long history. It all started a long, long <laughs> time ago, back in my living room, when you were doing a, a little magic in show. In your for living room, yeah. My living room. Uh, doing a little magic show for my daughter's birthday party. Gosh, how long was that? Maybe 20 years ago? I think it was her seventh birthday. 20 years ago. Yeah. So it's almost like, yeah, 20 years. Oh my gosh, 20 all right. Years. I just want you to hold your hand out like this. All right. And we put that there. All right. Now this eye will see everything. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, now what I'd like you to do is tell me when to stop. Just tell me when. Just anywhere. Stop. Right here. All right. Look. Now I'm going to put this over the eye. All right. So now the eye has seen what her card is. Okay. Well, I don't know, it's just some random card. Do you think that it was lucky enough just to become her card? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you really think it was? Yeah. All right, look. Yeah. Look at the card. Don't say if it is. I don't care if it is or not, okay? I mean, I really hope it is, though, because if it's not, then I'll quit magic. It was but... even before then yeah. um, that you were hanging around and um, I was taking you to school. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you coming over and, um, sometimes you watch my kids too, I think sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, a lot. so, you know, I've always been a fan of yours, Remy, and, you know, you're, you're just like, uh, another one of my kids, you know, I mean, I've always been your biggest fan, your biggest fan and was so proud of you that you took that little show and made it what it is today. I mean, you know, you were just doing little things and, and you were so patient with the girls. I mean, especially Crystal, she was, you know, just talk, 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 talk. And, and they were bantering you and, and heckling you and you just, um, 
handled them with patience and uh, more patience than I had. <laughs> um, but I could just see that, you know, at that point in time, you had a passion and you were very good at, I think, like, how old were you, like, at that time? 15. Like, you were 15? I was 15. I just started when I was 13. Yeah, yeah. And uh and I was like, you know, you you could really go far with this if you kept it up and and you did. And here you are. Look at you. All right. So tell us a little bit about um your journey. Um I know that you had um really made a lot of changes. Um mentally and spiritually through your whole um all the experiences that you've had but can you kind of walk us through um you know just kind of how you got through your your darkest hour and then how you came to where you are now so i feel like any one of these moments that that you have in life it's uh there's a lot of like Imagine like stone skipping, mm -hmm. right? You skip a stone. The first jump, like let's assume you're going to get like 15 skips, right? Yeah. The first skip is, and then the second one's really far away. And then the third one's slightly closer. And then the fourth one's slight. And then when you get to the 15, it's, and it's yeah. this focused moment and it clicks. Yeah. I feel like that's what happens with life. Every time you have one of those moments, from there you're skipping the next stone right so from that enlightenment moment you you go to the next one and then it's a big gap and then a yeah. smaller gap smaller smaller and then you hit another moment I, I totally agree with that because i think that sometimes especially if you you experience something or you maybe you hear like a certain philosophy and then you it just kind of like goes in either one one ear and out the other mm -hmm. And then you hear it again and you've had some experiences and you're like, oh, and yeah. it still, it still kind of glides through. And then you're like, oh, and then you, mm -hmm. you, you finally get it. Like sometimes you might get advice from somebody or you have an experience and then you have it again and then it hits home. I don't know how many times I've given advice and then somebody else said, oh, well, someone else said this. And they're like, they got it. And I'm like, okay, you know, sometimes you have to hear it more than once. At least you got it from somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it does take, I mean, when I started listening to, um, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Abraham Hicks. Um, mm -hmm. at the, the first I got introduced to it, I, you know, I would just, didn't get it. I had to listen to it a lot before it finally kind of, oh, I get it. And then every, every sense, you know, every word that she could, she said, I could take in and understand, but sometimes it just takes a while. So, so you it's, had a lot of skips and bumps like the rest of us. Yeah. The more and more that you go through it, I think, you know, you, you can recognize the, the skips, you know, I think that once you've done it a couple of times, you can say like, oh, I recognize that. The The thing that's hard about this is when you first start going through it, like think about math, right? Like two plus two is four. Yeah. It's a very simple, like, yeah, two plus two is four. We get it. But there was a time that you didn't understand the idea of adding two things together. Yeah. And like you had to be taught that, mm -hmm. you know, and now we kind of take that for granted. I feel like every time we learn something about ourselves through this like spiritual thing, you'll understand later why I said it's just a thing because I still thing. am coming up with the right term for myself. It's a uh, thing. But it's, uh, you know, the more that we go through this, I was in the middle of saying that, um, you keep learning it and experiencing it, but it's still something new. Each one is something new, which is why, you know, yes, you're building upon what you've already had, but you're still getting into a new idea. Yeah. So that's why it takes so long to click. So I feel like a lot of times people expect it to be like, oh, I had a question, I got an answer. And now why am I not applying this to life? Well, it takes a little bit. You know, you're applying something to life. Right. 
or you don't know how to apply it. You understand the concept, right. but you just don't know how to apply it or when to apply right. it. Um, and, or, or, you, you know, you've learned something, you got something down solid and then you learn something new. And then you also feel like you're, you've regressed because now you're learning something new and you're like, ah, oh, just don't get it as well. And then you're trying to apply both and it's just not, it's not gelling. Yeah. So it just takes, you know, a, a while. I mean, sometimes it's three steps forward, a couple steps back. Um, mm -hmm. Or sometimes you feel like, I just, I just lost it all. <laughs> and then it comes back, you know, so. Sometimes it's no steps forward. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, and that's okay too. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a journey. It's not a, a, a linear process. It is. Um, I think the thing that gets hard about that philosophy, though, is when people start feeling like it's three steps forward and four steps back when I'm starting further back than where I started from, you know, uh, and part of it is just trying to get through that idea, you know, just trying to get through, you know, realizing that even if you took a step and the step wasn't the best step, still a step. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like a step is still forward. You know, learning how something doesn't work is just as important as learning how something does. Oh you know? yeah. And um there was a um a man, a gentleman that I've interviewed a couple of times on my podcast, and he channels uh Dama Saint Germain and his name is Jeffrey Hoppy, and he talks about the dragon. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, what's the dragon? And he said, well, you know, you're on your spiritual journey, you know, and all of a sudden some big event might just crash you down and you just can almost have to start over. And, and I, I went through that, I, you know, I thought that I was really like super happy. And then all of a sudden I came down with, um, Epstein Barr mm -hmm. reactivation and, I, you know, I was just laying on the couch, hoping I would die, you know, <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm a happiness coach. I should be able to figure this out. And I couldn't. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, but, but I now looking back, I'm glad I went through that. I needed to go through that. That was a super important experience for myself to go mm -hmm. through at the time. I didn't like going through it, but looking back, I'm glad I did. Sure. So and You have to go through them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all okay. It's all yeah. okay. Because so, it's, I, there's that quote, there's no good or evil, but thinking makes it so. Yes. You know, <laughs> it, it, it is all okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, but it it's, happens. Generally speaking, everything that we're worried, like everything that we look at, they're like, oh my God, these things happened to us. They happened. That's factual. Mm -hmm. But you also have to look at that whole statement and realize the entire statement is factual, right? It happened to me. Yes, it did. Yep. But also happened. ED, past put tense. that in past tense. Like that's also just as true as the rest of that statement. So when you say like, oh my God, I've been through hell. Yes. You, and you made it. Been <laughs> through hell, right? The hell part is true. And the fact that it's over is also true. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and the thing is that, um, you know, I've learned more and more about living in the present moment and, you know, meditation has helped me get there. Um, also discovering who I really am in amongst, you know, the whole scheme of things makes you just kind of look at life a little differently and you're not so wrapped up into, um, what you've been told life should be instead of you're like, Oh, this is happening now. This is really cool. And wouldn't it be cool if this happened instead of, Oh, I need to have that. I need to have this happen. Or I'm afraid of what people think of me. Or if this doesn't happen, I'm just going to die. You know, instead mm -hmm. it's like, Hmm, that just happened. Hmm. I wonder why <laughs> instead of, Oh no. So um, you know, but living in the present moment, that's where 
we live. I mean, that's where Mm -hmm. we are. You can't take a photo in the future. You can't take a photo of the past. You can only be here and now. And that's where life is the most richest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because I mean, this is it. This is the only moment that we can prove, you know? Absolutely. So tell us a little bit more about your, your path. Uh, well, as you know, but the other people don't, uh, I started in a really bad household. Uh, my stepmom was not exactly the, the kindest or nicest of people. She, um, she just put me through a lot, you know, and, and actually it's funny years later, uh, I went back to, so she and my dad had gotten divorced. And I went back to the house to pick up some things. And I tried to talk to her. You know, I tried to say, look, you and my dad are divorced. That's fine. You're you're still a part of my life. You know, we could settle things. Yeah. Maybe. And she's like, well, you know, you got to admit you were a bad kid. And I was like, okay, fine. Let's admit that I was eight years old. Moving across the country with divorced parents into a house. Like, can we at least, like, acknowledge that I was eight? eight she's like you were a bad kid i was like can we acknowledge that i was eight she's like you were a bad i said fine if that's all you want to believe is that i was a bad kid and had nothing to do with the fact that i was a child (laughs) fine enjoy your life that was actually the last i spoke to her um so the moment i got out of the house like the moment i turned 18 it was very much like i'm 18 i'm gone yeah and I, I just did anything I could to get out. I went to college for one year, realized that wasn't for me. Uh, went to Vegas by bus. Um, small thing in between that was that I was, uh, I was auditioning for a show called Phenomenon, and I was flown out to L.A. And when I was out there, I realized I was on the other side of the country. It was the first time being on the West Coast. Yeah. So when I came back, where I was living didn't work out because I was living with some friends. Mm-hmm. They kicked me out, so I just bought a bus ticket to Vegas, and I was homeless for the next, like, two and a half years. Yeah, you just and went all over the country, didn't you? Just... It was amazing. It was the best time of my life. Uh, in fact, there are some times now that I look back at it, and I consider going back. Just, just because living off your no... wits, huh? It, there was no responsibilities. I could, you know, every literally every day was living in the moment you know i didn't have to worry about oh my god what bills do i have coming up i just had to like i gotta eat today all right let's let's figure that out (laughs) um so that was and for me that was a big deal that was almost like a way of just starting my life you know yeah Uh, i acknowledge being at, at late teens and early 20s i had no idea what i was doing um, well, to go back, but I also was very aware of the fact that in my late teens and early twenties, I did not know what I was doing. Like it was very much like I don't know anything, and I knew I didn't know anything. So I very much said to myself, "This is your time to be dumb and learn something." And so I, I used that opportunity, being at that age, to just go and do dumb things. Well, going back to when I first met you Mm -hmm. and, you know, I knew what was going on in your household because you, you know, divulged that information to me. And, um, and to me, my heart just went out to you. And, and I love that you felt like you could come over to my house to hang out with my kids and, um, you know, just, um, feel like you could kind of be normal and accepted and and you were and you yeah. are still a great person I mean I wouldn't have my kids around you if I felt otherwise and uh we always I mean the kids always enjoyed to have you over and I couldn't understand you know why your situation was but that you came out of that the way you are just um I I just love you for that. I mean, I just, I'm so proud of you. I mean. If I didn't have places like yours to go to, it would have been very different. 
You know, one of the things that I, I think I can say that I was most fortunate in was getting grounded as a kid was very different than like at other people's houses. Because when my friends got grounded, they had to stay in their house. And my version of getting grounded was you're grounded, leave. So it was always like, people don't want me here. I'm going to go somewhere where I feel safe. Until I, you know, met you, that was very much, you know, just going anywhere in the neighborhood. And I didn't do anything. It's not like I was ever like one of the kids that was like graffitiing walls or something. I was reading about magic. Like, that's it. That's all I was doing. No. Uh, You know what I mean? I was like the biggest nerd, you know? And as a matter of fact, you were, uh, you had one of your first shows in my living room. I did. I had one of my first shows in your living room. That was, yeah. And uh, I think, but I paid you like a hundred bucks or something. And I think you were just like, oh, you know, <laughs> I can make money. Yeah. Um, they'll buy you some more magic. Um, they bought me some more magic kits. Can I tell you, that's all my money goes to today. It just goes yeah. to more and more magic kits. That's but it. you you were always welcome um in our house we all enjoyed you and then all the neighbors loved you and enjoyed you and thought very highly of you um we felt you were very responsible and um and i i just wish i could could have done more you did more than enough <laughs> <laughs> well i'm so glad that you're here today and so tell me what was, I know you went through, um, you know, with two years living on your own, just kind mm-hmm. of by your, your wits and, and, and I know you did some performances to, you know, get by, um, as well. So what, what, what got you to kind of get over that period of time, um, where you feel like if I were to be if I were to answer that question completely honestly I never got over that time uh Mm -hmm. it's something that I am so very happy that I did because now no matter what's going on in my life most people they say well worst case scenario is that you lose the house and you've got nowhere to live (laughs) and my brain goes I've done that that's easy okay you know, it, it's What's one the of the worst thing that can happen. Okay, go there. Right, go. like Fine it blows it. it so far out of proportion that you, it, it almost makes things a little bit easier. Yeah. You know, like there's the, the joke of like, I want to sit next to, like if I'm on a plane, I want to sit next to somebody with high anxiety because in turbulence, the person with high anxiety is going to sit there and say, this is just regular turbulence. This is not us flying over a volcano with dinosaurs spouting out of it, okay? This is just regular <laughs> turbulence. Where that's the person I want next to me. Yeah, you know, right. You blow it out of proportion. You know, you go through something like that. And, you know, everybody says it. When you're 18, you're still a kid. I oh, yeah, haven't experienced absolutely. anything yet. And I actually, I mean, I, I think that's almost right. I think that when you're 18 and you're out on your own, the first time you're on, out on your own, you're zero. Mm-hmm. you know like you lived you know the entire lifespan of being a child now yeah. that you're out on your own you're starting over because most of those things that you chapter. learned as a kid they don't apply anymore they're no. they're gone you know oh my god i gotta i gotta wake up and make myself breakfast as a kid that's i gotta go open up the fridge i gotta get the thing out of the you know the bowl i gotta pour that's what it's like as a kid as an adult it's i gotta Think about what I'm going to eat tomorrow and go to the grocery store today to plant. That's a very different mentality. I can make the money so I can go to the grocery store. Well, so right, can, you know. right. You know, and that's a whole other beast. But, uh, yeah. you know, just to get to that point and it's all, you, you really are starting over. So people, I, I think that one of the things people do is they put too much pressure on themselves. They say, I'm 25 years old. I should know so much more. I should be doing, you know, better. No, you're seven. Exactly. And I know when I went through, and I'm not sure, you may not know a lot of this, but after um, my divorce, and I was a single mom, and I had not been on my own. I mean, I graduated from college one weekend, got married to Chris the next. Mm -hmm. So, so I was living on my own and still trying to adjust financially. And the finally dawned on me, okay, well, what's the worst that could happen? And I just played that out 
And then I thought, well, what, what am I so worried about? Well, you know what I was worried about? I was worried about what people would think. Oh, you know, it was one. the pride of being, letting myself get into a position where I would, you know, lose my house, lose my car, mm -hmm. be unemployed, have to live on the street. Now, granted, and I never got to that point, but I, that's what I was worrying about. That's what was on my shoulders every day. Yeah. I mean, I, that's a I, huge weight to carry. Oh yeah. And I, you know, I, I was standing in line at a food bank. Mm -hmm. Um, I was on food stamps at one point and, and it was very humbling. Sure. Um, but now, um, you know, like you said, you've been through all that before. You're like, nah, okay. Well, if it happens again, I can, I can get out of it again. You know, I can handle that. But which actually goes back to what we were saying about the stone skips, right? You, you go through your first one and you're like, oh, that was a stone skip. And now you've done it enough times that now something comes up. You're like, that's a, that's a stone skip. I gotta, I gotta hold that. There's like, um, some, so I've read articles where a lot of people who've made millions and lost it all. And then they mm -hmm. created the millions again, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's that definitely like that philosophy. Um, so what Sorry. is, so what are some, what? Sorry, totally out of nowhere. We just got a rooster and he's crowing outside <laughs> and I just heard him crow and it made me very happy. <laughs> is that a happy hack for you? It is. <laughs> I found out after having him, I, I like the sounds of birds. Like birds chirping. I don't care what time it is. Like they don't wake me up. And when I wake up to them, I'm like, oh, y'all are, y'all are talking. Good night. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, now where are you that you can have a rooster? Oakland Park. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. technically, we're not allowed to have a crowing rooster, so I'm asking that everybody who listens to this to not rat us out. But uh, I've gone through the neighborhood at several times throughout the day, hearing other various birds that were clearly in people's backyards. So I, I don't really think anybody seems to care. Nobody's enforcing it. <laughs> Nobody seems to be enforcing What's it. What's your we're rooster's a few name? More chicken soon. Uh, you... Our our rooster's name is Foghorn Leghorn. Oh, absolutely. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. He looks just like him. He's all white with the red thing and the red. And the... Yeah. My dad um, was a twin. And okay. when he was, I don't know how old he was, when they had these um, banny roosters. So, okay. so they had one named Jake, I believe. And they, it, I mean, back then they would, they would fight these roosters would fight each other to the death apparently mm -hmm. and it was very illegal but i don't know for some reason my dad had one and uh they took it and he and his rooster won quite a bit um but i remember one time i guess this was back when my uh i don't know uh, where shoes were rationed Okay. And my grandfather had just gotten a, a brand new pair of shoes and Jake did not like my grandfather and put one of his talons right through my grandfather's shoes. And I think that was the end of Jake um, soon after. <laughs> um, but yeah, oh, that's cute. I love that. So you're going to get some hens and have eggs mm -hmm. and all that too? Well, yeah, I'm doing the whole thing. Oh, nice. Nice. I like pick him up and take him into the house and he you know, like hangs out with us in the mornings. And... <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, so back to, um, mm -hmm. so tell me about your, your philosophy. You said you started to meditate and that seemed to really help you get really keyed in on some things. Can you tell us about I was, that? so I'd stopped being homeless, uh, started working more as a magician, moved to Gainesville, Orlando, South Florida. Uh, and when, well, I think I had to be 24, 23, something like that. I started having like massive anxiety, mm. uh, having that existential crisis, 
right? Yeah. It was finally asking the question of, of what do I believe in? Mm -hmm. And uh, that question like starts really heavy. You know, it starts, it starts as a super heavy question. And then it kind of, I guess, dials back a little. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of, you're like, huh! and then it just <laughs> drops. And then it builds up, you know, and, and it starts to really kind of eat at you. So I started looking into religions. And one of the things for me, like a safe space that I've always had is uh, the bathroom. If I go into the bathroom... Uh, and the shower is on and uh, a little fun hack uh, for people with ADHD. I shower, I've showered with the lights off for like 30 years. Oh, really? Um, the sound of the shower and the lack of sight has, it, it makes the world less overwhelming. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it gets rid of like all, all of that stimulation, pretty much like everything that's coming in, like, uh, like just kind of masks it all being under the water you know it like kind of numbs the the sense of touch so it literally just kind of cleanses out everything at least at least for me and the other thing that it did was it is like the only place that nobody bothers you yeah you know like people just know they're like you're in the bathroom i don't know what you're doing in there but you're doing something that i don't want to be a part of <laughs> you know <laughs> you're wet so, so i guess we're just gonna have to wait <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, it was the one place that, like, I was, I was always left alone. So, um, when I was going through this, like, crisis, and then it started building back up, I, I found myself sitting in the bathroom quite a bit. And then my dad gave me some advice about, I was trying to meet a celebrity. Uh, not meet, I was trying to meet, a, like, a magician celebrity to, like, learn from him. And my dad said, well, if you've read enough of his books, you should be able to do this thing where you create them in your mind and you speak to them. Yeah. And like they can speak back to you. So when I started thinking about that, I started creating this area that I could converse with people. And it was the beginning of me making a place called, called a mind palace. Oh, right? I like There's that the memory term. palace, right? People have made those, right? That's a huge thing, the memory palace. Uh, but I didn't use it at first for memory. Mm -hmm. I use it as a space for organization. Okay. I use it as a space to like exist, mm -hmm. you know, and, and give myself a little bit of focus. This all plays into the meditation, I, I promise. Um, so here I am, I'm in this space, I'm giving my mind something to do. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting in the bathroom, creating a space in my mind and then I realize I'm doing what has to be close to meditating, right? Like one day it dawns on me that I've just been sitting still for hours on end in my bathroom thinking, right? So then I start looking into meditation. Of course, the first thing that pops up whenever you look at up meditation is Buddhism. Yeah. Right. And I started really reading into Buddhism. And of course, Buddhism led to Taoism, Hinduism, mm, okay. uh, and then, you know, being born Jewish and learning about, and, you know, growing, sorry, born Jewish, growing up in a pretty much Christian world, learning about that, having Muslim friends, seeing all these religions, I started making these connections. Yeah. Of like, okay, if there are some things in some of these religions that are true, right, like, um, I'll the easy example I give is that I agree with confession, hmm. right? Somebody who's not religious at all. I agree with confession wholeheartedly, not because God is forgiving you for your sins, but because you were actually able to say the thing that was bothering you out loud. You, you, yeah. you defeated Acknowledging it, you said it, it out not, loud. not uh, suppressing it. Uh, right, right. You did that. So if that's valid, there has to be other things that are valid. Yeah, And if all of these religions are all supposed to be about the same things, then find the, the through line, and that's got to be the valid thing. So there's a lot of reading and reading and reading, just kind of learning about the, the common through lines. Yeah. And it all came back to Buddhism. So I started di really diving into it. I started understanding, you know, what, what the Four Noble Truths were you know under and started to really agree with it it made sense uh getting well, to the fourth 
truth it's stating you know the way to enlightenment is through the eightfold path mm-hmm. and then i started looking into the eightfold path and i thought this is amazing right let me let me meditate on this let me let me sit down and i remember having that moment right Boom, like you know the the thing that you oh. see where the finger hits the forehead and everything <laughs> right? i remember having that moment and i saw I hate telling these people. I saw nothing. Like, just the ever-expanding no- nothing. I-, I, didn't, I didn't see a light. I didn't connect with God. I didn't feel connected to another human. I didn't feel connected to the earth. Like, I-, I didn't feel anything. Mm-hmm. And it was... But it was the biggest nothing I had never I had ever seen. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I, it's hard to explain it is, into those words. Is it kind of it was, like a dis disengaging? Like, like um, yes. Like like a um, becoming unattached to everything. To everything. But I didn't. I didn't see like these tendrils of light that were explained. Where it's like, oh, I felt connected to every. It was I felt disconnected from everything. Mm-hmm. And that was the moment that I, I became an atheist, mm. like just through and through became an atheist, but it didn't disqualify all the stuff that I had just read. Mm-hmm. You know, the biggest argument we get into about religion is whether or not what happens after we die is valid. Right. That's the argument we get into, but that's like not the, the argument part. You mean the judgment Excuse part? Me? The judgment yeah. part? Yeah. That's the thing that everybody talks about. We're like, oh my God, heaven, you know, hell, are we going to go here? Are we going to go? I don't know. And you don't know. Mm-mm. They don't know. Nobody knows because everything was written by man. The thing we should be arguing about is how we treat each other. Right. <laughs> That's the thing that we should be focused on. Because if I'm an atheist and, not, and I'm wrong, at least spent my life trying to make people better. Right. And you'll just be surprised you know? or, or not. Like, right like i hope i'm wrong you know what i'm saying like i hope i'm wrong with this right but anyway so, living for the, that living for now not right because you fear not because exactly fear. yeah you know and that's when you come to conclusions of like oh you know are you really a good person if you're not doing something based on fear you know, does that make you, no, that makes you a safe person. That makes you almost right. selfish, right? Penn Jillette says, uh, people ask if I don't believe in God, why don't I rape and murder as much as I want? And Penn says, I do. I rape and murder exactly as much as I want. I just want to do it zero. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, okay. So you start collapsing well, you, on ideas like more that. more right? compassion you know exactly it's, yeah it's like you know when people say i want to be brutally honest well that's fine just focus on the honest not the brutal yeah you know <laughs> so we uh, i would continue to to look into this and the thing that i loved about the eightfold path was that if you took it at its core it was something that could apply to your daily life now for eightfold path they say right speech right that means no false true you know, like no false sentences that means don't to lie. me <laughs> right don't lie as a magician you could see where i have that issue so you're entertaining that lying. yeah but you still want to be truthful you know like you you still have to realize that even as an entertainer and this is not siding one way or another on politics. It was one of the things that frustrated me the most on Trump being president was that regardless of your policies or anything, you still can't get up there and tell half the nation that you don't like them. Mm. You know, like you have a responsibility when you step up to do something, you know, and, and saying the same thing on Biden had Biden said, you know, given the finger to half the country, I would disagree with that as well. Um, so in going back, I feel like we have to, we have those responsibilities as, as performers. So we try our best to, to abide by these rules, you know, for, for ourselves. Now, I don't necessarily always believe that you shouldn't lie. There actually are a couple of very good scenarios 
that your sentence can be a little white lie here or there, right? Like we're having like a surprise a, party. Don't tell anybody. Exactly. Right. <laughs> like there, there's always going to be these little, little exceptions. So by saying no lies, we set a standard for ourselves that we just can't keep. Yeah. So you figure out what right speech means to you. For me, right speech means building. It means growth. It means ensuring a place of safety for others and a lack of judgment. Yeah. Right. So that's what right speech means. Mm -hmm. Now, at least to me, right? Again, I think these are things that everybody can apply to themselves. Right action. You can be honest and really hurt somebody too. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you have to decide if right now is the best moment for honesty. Mm -hmm. right and if people say that omission is also lying well there are certain times you don't need to tell somebody the truth yeah Uh, at least right now you know what i mean like i don't i might not need to tell you now um no never mind that was a bad example but anyway i just i wouldn't need to tell you now i could tell you in five minutes i could tell you in 20 minutes maybe i shouldn't tell you right before you went on stage your friend died right yeah. But technically that's a lie by omission because I know something that you should know and I'm not telling you right now I'm omitting it. Right? Right. So by we don't need to set those standards. Now it's the same thing on things like right action. Right? Right action says no sex, no drugs, no drinking, no violence. Right? But if you're standing around and somebody else is getting hurt violence would actually save a person at that do you really want to be the one that this lets it happen let it happen that's just as evil what's the the saying uh all it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to stand around and do nothing yeah exactly um i mean i don't agree with no sex personally i think that you know something like that if you're doing it consensually allows for a beautiful connection between Mm -hmm. people right uh no drugs yes if you're an addict right yeah but like i think drugs can be a wonderful thing if you understand what they're doing right people confuse caffeine we say oh caffeine keeps me awake no it doesn't it just prevents you from being tired yes that's not actually the same thing right you're like all right i'm not tired (laughs) You're not awake. You're not alert out going into the world. You're just not tired, right? So that's what I mean when I think like, oh, no drugs. No, it means use the right drug for the right reason at the right moment, right? Right. I'm not saying go out and do heroin all weekend long because you want to feel good. That's, (laughs) you know, that's not what I'm saying. You know, as long as you're not hurting yourself and others, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's just kind of the rule of thumb, you know, Mm -hmm. and whatever you're saying or doing as long as you're not hurting yourself or others sure sure um you know for the eightfold path and then the thing that i did for there is is then tattooed them all on my fingers actually you did oh look at that so each one is uh so like right concentration effort uh sorry effort concentration meditation uh livelihood view understanding action and speech awesome i love that you know those are all those are like my own little hacks kind of uh, allows me to to look at each one and it's just like a little reminder throughout the day yeah it it allows you to just kind of stop and pause yeah Mm -hmm. um you know do i really need to be anxious about this situation Mm -hmm. um do I need to fear the future for any reason? Do I need to be rehashing the past? You know, there's so many different things that that we've gotten in the habit of doing, and it's not helpful. You and know? sometimes you just need to check in. Yeah. You know, sometimes just sitting there and saying, you know, oh my God, am I feeling anxious? I am feeling anxious. Why? Well, why? Yeah. Maybe if you, when you get to why and you come to the end of it, you're like, I'm feeling anxious because I need to make myself a pepperoni sandwich and there's some pepperoni in the fridge. Then you're like, that's not a good reason to be anxious. 
okay, you know, you can, you acknowledge it. You say, all right, I'm anxious about it. You, you validate whatever the reason is. Okay, why am I anxious about the pepperoni in the fridge? Uh, am I worried about the expiration date? Okay, let me go. You know, the, you, you figure it out. You just, you work it through. On small things, it sounds ridiculous, but you're still working it through. And on big things, it's at least spent it on the small things. I think, because um, I've suffered with depression and anxiety and panic attacks in the past. Mm-hmm. Now, depression and um or being triggered can uh come up occasionally um because maybe something i just haven't dealt with or reminded me of something and i just or it's something i'm frustrated about myself and then i it's more of self um like attacking myself and not doing something to the level i wish I had done or haven't done yet, you know, um, that's my perfectionism coming through. (laughs) Um, but I feel like that, um, with, because I don't, I don't have to take antidepressants. I don't take anti-anxiety medications and I don't take anything for my panic attacks anymore. Um, but one thing I've learned is, and this has been kind of like a game changer. If I start feeling down about myself, usually it's a digestive system issue. Yeah. And it's crazy how that can cause mental, you know, um, le- your energy levels in in your brain can reduce your serotonin um yeah. dopamine all of that because you have so much going on in your digestive system that that affects that so a lot of times if i'm depressed i look at my okay what have i been eating that has caused me to uh, and it's it's certainly when it's passed and i'm like oh I feel so much better now <laughs> and i'm i'm not depressed anymore um and it's crazy get- how like we don't realize that a lot of it is physical. I mean, when I was when I had my mm-hmm. Epstein bar, um, I, I was like, gosh, you know, all all of my my happiness tricks aren't working. And I'm like, this has to be physical because I didn't had nothing in my life at that time that would cause me anxiety mm-hmm. um, or depression or or wanting to just you know fall asleep and hope I wouldn't wake up. I mean. I I didn't want to talk to anybody. I had to kind of fake who I was, um, how I would react to somebody, you know, oh, something sad really happened. I didn't care, but I had to go, oh, really? I'm so sorry, you know, (laughs) but I I was like, oh my gosh, I am, I don't care, something is wrong. And so I went to my doctor and he's like, well, this is what's going on with you. And that's why you feel the way you do is because my energy was completely just on the slowest low and right. and and that's you know a lot of cause for depression it causes um uh, uh the fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome right. and i mean that's just two of the many different things that can cause it you know depression and everything else but um yeah, if it's not physical, then you can definitely um, think about how to talk your talk yourself out of it. You know. Well, in in magic, there is something that we learned uh, called the ideometer response. Ooh, tell yeah. me more. Have you ever seen a uh, like a, somebody work with a pendulum? Yes, I have one. Well, what's very fascinating about about pendulums is um, the reason that they work is due to the user. Okay. The user pictures the pendulum spinning or swaying or going whatever direction. Yeah. And the brain self-actualizes and makes that into a reality, right? So you'll sit here and hold it, right? And I, when I do it in my performances, I even have people hold my wrist perfectly still so they know I'm definitely not doing it. 
yeah. and yet the fingers and the tips will still make the necessary micro movements because your brain is imagining it. Mm-hmm. Now I've seen this and do it firsthand. So I know that this is legitimate. Mm-hmm. Right? If that's true, that means the brain can do that with everything. Yeah. It's so powerful. Right? If I'm picturing a micro movement in my hand that's making a pendulum spin in a circle, that means if I picture a wound that I have on my leg and white blood cells running to it, my brain is going to do that a little bit more. If I picture, you know, uh, the voice in my head that's you know giving me all those negative intrusive thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to make them more valid. Mm-hmm. And I say that in a good way, because I think one of the things that most commonly happens to people is that we shut that voice up. And what happens when you want to talk and no one lets you? Oh, yeah. You eventually start screaming. Mm-hmm. Right? You, you lash out. You... So a lot of times we have these negative thoughts and we say to ourselves, oh, it's negative. Thought. Put it away. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. That's just going to make it louder, right? You have a negative thought. Laugh about it to yourself. I'm going to say something really bad. This is so, I'm sorry for everybody. It's going to be really bad, okay? But like, if you walk by and there's a voice in your head that goes, ha ha, they're fat. Okay, don't say that out loud, obviously. But don't get mad at that voice in your head because that voice is there. Like, Mm -hmm. it is there. Yeah. You don't have to acknowledge it. You don't have to shut it up, but you don't actually have to do anything about it. Most of the time, we just want to be heard. And so does that voice. It just wants to be heard like any of the other ones. Yeah, a a lot of times what I explain to people as far as like meditation, you know, it, uh, it, you get, first of all, you start having all these chaotic, you know, thoughts that Mm -hmm. are just kind of rampantly coming in and you don't know what to make of them, but if you kind of try to separate them out as best you can, like it's a parade. I don't know how many people have experienced parades. I was kind of surprised the other day when I talked to some kids and I'm like, have you ever been to a parade? And they're like, well, not really. I'm like, okay. (laughs) But the rest of us have probably attended some sort of parade. You've at least uh, seen. Or watched one on TV. Right, right. And if you can imagine like every thing that's coming down the street as a thought like you've got a float that's coming by and then you've got you know the marching band that comes by and then you've got the Mm -hmm. dancers that come by those are thoughts and just watch them go by just entertained go hmm that one's kind of interesting and then another oh that was pretty good thought yeah oh i Mm -hmm. like that that one uh i don't like that one so much okay but whatever you know, and then let them go farther and farther in between so that mm-hmm. you can pick up the candy that falls in between, you know, the, those, those delicate moments that are just, you know, of nothingness. Um, and well, that's really what's helped me, you know, okay. as far as, you know, being so able the, to look at my thoughts and. And, you know, that kind of falls into one of the things that, that helped me out. We were talking earlier about the mind palace, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one thing that helped with me making that is that when, when I walk in, right? So like I sit, close my eyes. I, it's the same process every time. Uh, I'm in a very large city in the middle of winter. There's a brick wall to my left, a chain link fence to my right. And I walk down, I open up the chain link fence uh, go to the left. I open it up magically because it's my brain. I can, you know, and it opens. Uh, I go in to the, the big metal industrial door, shut it behind me. It's all pitch black. And I pull down a light switch and then it's a comedy club. Oh, and it's a full comedy club with like a bar, several doors. There's a stage to the right. Uh, and in there I have different rooms. Mm -hmm. So like I have a medical center in there. If I'm going through something where like, like if I, if I have an injury, mm-hmm. that's the room that I go to, right? So it gives me this, this focus. If I'm creating something, I go through a different door because that door leads to an actual workshop that I used to work in 
that I created in my brain. But then specifically, if I need to meditate, I go to another room. And this room, because it's my mind and we can go anywhere, but you open up the door, you're immediately in like an abandoned missile silo in Russia. Whoa. <laughs> but the reason is, is because this room is just this big circular empty room where you can hear, you know, the world outside. You know, that, that was the point of it. Uh, and I have different things in each of these doors that I have all have something behind it, usually a person oh. or, or an interaction of, of sorts. And it's like my, my dog is in there, you know, like, so it happens. It makes me more aware of life. I, you know, when I pet her, mm -hmm. right, I'm fully submerging into petting her in real life. So now in, in my brain, I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. I bring up all of this because as somebody with severe ADHD, being able to create the space that I was in and then meditate gave my brain like an extra activity. Yeah. Right. It said like, Hey, I uh, do all this. And my brain's like, Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do it. And now that I've wasted so much brain power on not wasted, but given so much brain power to this making my world. Yeah. When it comes down to meditating, my, my thoughts are a lot more simple. Because now it's, it's, I got something to focus on. Now I just got to be here. And being here is a lot easier than just trying to exist in a mind that's completely unorganized. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I have, I'm, um, I don't know if I would say a uh, functioning ADHD person. You know, functioning uh, ADHD. <laughs> um, some things are, hyper organized and some things are just, mm -hmm. just um as they should be <laughs> right. as they should be we need to have a level of chaos mm -hmm. like there definitely needs to be like let's wait through the hands hold on. you know like you need to do that yeah um and but the thing is what's funny is i kind of like my adhd tendencies because um, I will go through my, I just kind of like to go do things as I want to do them when I want to do them. And I'll be flitting here and there and here and there, but I get more done to be honest, because I'll be in the middle of doing the dishes or something and the dishwasher will be open. And then, oh, I need to put in a little laundry. So then I go get my clothes. And then I go, oh, the, the bed needs to be made. So then I go make the bed. <laughs> and so then I have to kind of work my way back to the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. And But I, I think I enjoy seeing how much, how far I can get into that stream of things that I have left. And then go back to where, where was it that I it, it all started? It's um, so funny watching people backtrack that thought, right? Because you're like, we were here. We were there. <laughs> yes. Okay, we did this and then this and then. Okay, now, now I know. Got it. All right, that, that's where we were. Let's go. Yeah, I don't know how many times I have walked into a room and go, what, what was I doing? And I was like, oh, yeah, know, I was, look, I was looking for my glasses. And, and I'm like, where are my glasses? Where are my yeah. glasses? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that the walking into a room thing is not actually an ADHD thing, but a regular human being trait? Well, that's good. Thank God. <laughs> uh, when we, uh, there's one other thing that I wanted to touch on. Okay. Uh, which was a meditation that happened later. Right. So now I, you have to picture like going through all these meditations it was every single day going through it and discovering that there is two different kinds of meditation right there's like one uh there's a working kind and the other one is the peace kind right the the tranquility version yeah. first thing to say is is you know for people that are listening that try to get started they don't know where to start i always say just do a minute or two minutes three minutes, whatever, whatever you can do. If you take any time to do it and you improve on that, that'll be a great start. But also taking that time to go through the eightfold path and figure out what they mean to you. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really big deal. 
I had now started going through those meditations on working on, on building each one off of each other, off of each other, off of each other. And then one day I, I was meditating and I saw like a light, right? So you had the first time where I saw nothing. Yeah. Then you have this future time that came up where I saw just, just a light, a light. Yeah. And it was one of those moments that just really registered internally because it said like, I now have even created something I never saw before. Yeah. You know, that, that brightness to it. I bring that up because there's always goals there. There's always things that you're going to reach and it's something that you can do that's always going to benefit you right? If you try to say that meditation works for other people and it doesn't work for you, then you don't understand the concept of it. Because in meditation, you're going to find your questions and your answers. Meditation's not going to give you my answers. No. It give you yours. Right. I think that's such a, a point. It's, that people... it's a way to develop a relation to a relationship in a passageway to your inner wisdom. Yeah. Even um, if that inner wisdom is knowing that you don't know something. Well, right. That it needs yeah. to be explored more, or maybe yeah. it's not time now. Maybe there's more things that you need to experience first. Exactly. Um, yeah. And there, there are like, there's calming meditation. Yeah. But there's, there's, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but there's interoceptive and exteroceptive type meditations. So if you are in tune with your body and mm -hmm. the workings, I mean, you know, when your heart's starting to go a little faster, or maybe you know, when you're, yeah. you feel it's colder in the room than it, before everybody else, or maybe mm -hmm. you feel like a little uncomfortable or you I'm kind of more of this. I am more, I, I know everything that's going on with my body. Now, if you, that, so that's interoceptive. If you're exteroceptive, then you might have trouble describing uh, how you feel emotionally oh, or okay. physically. Okay. So if you are interoceptive like me, you might have more trouble going inside for those uh, to focus close your eyes and because then all of a sudden all that just gets bigger you know right. everything you feel is just being overemphasized so one way to get away from that is to focus on a point of light on the wall or focus on a candle or do some sort of um drawing exercise mm -hmm. you know sure now if you're exteroceptive which means maybe you know everybody is just yeah nah, nah, you know and and you're just getting overwhelmed by your environment and you need to escape into that 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 sacred space within yourself then then that is really effective that's going to so if you're interoceptive you need to do an exteroceptive uh, mm -hmm. meditation if you're exteroceptive then you need to do an interoceptive meditation would you agree that the goal is to become i'm going to make up a word of of ambicentive like ambidextrous yeah because like i found out like i'm an ambivert I didn't know that was a phrase, but you can be extrovert, introvert, or an ambivert. You know? Well, you, you, you're exactly right. So what you want to become has, is you're developing your, developing your neuroplasticity. Right. So meditation is a refocusing practice. Mm -hmm. It's not an, a, let's eliminate our thoughts practice and go to complete void The it's, it's, you're always, your brain's always going to be working. Otherwise it's shut off. You'd be in coma. Okay. So right. it's oh, refocusing. Yes. If you're refocusing and refocusing, it gets so fast, it's lightning speed that it seems like you're not, you know, you're not fighting those thoughts because you'll be able to refocus on where you're at. So mm -hmm. if you're interoceptive and you're doing something exteroceptive, your internal workings are trying to 
outweigh what you're doing on the outside. Right. And so you're trying to refocus that I am worried or my stomach's upset or I'm really cold or, you know, my clothes are itchy. Okay. I'm trying to focus away from that and focus on what I'm doing externally or conversely, I'm at a busy airport and I, it's just so loud and I just can't take it anymore. Okay. I'm just going to go in, close my eyes and I'm going to focus on, you know, a, a word or, um, you know, you're just, you're, you're going inwards and you might hear, you know, flight, whatever is, da, 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 and you got to be focused back in. Mm-hmm. So it is a refocusing from the external to the internal, from the internal to the external from the thoughts to just one thought. So it, yeah, so it's always a, re, a refocusing um, practice. And the better you refocus, the more you can be in the present moment more and more and more. And that's where the sweet spot is. And it also becomes easier to notice those places that you need to work. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Be able to that's, focus on one thing here and get that done and then focus over here and one thing and mm-hmm. get that done. Um, even if you're going back and forth between a few things, right? you know, you're, you're focusing, like if I'm doing the dishes, I'm doing the dishes. If I'm doing the laundry, I'm doing the laundry. I'm not doing the dishes and thinking about the laundry. Right, right. You know, that kind of thing. I know yeah. that's like in a gross exaggeration, but you know. Well, you have it though. It's yeah. The same. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about about what you've got going with your magic. Tell us everybody. What, what... So right now we've been working on a couple of new shows. We started off the year with about 300 shows in St. Augustine. Wow. And uh, we took that and we're now developing, I say we, uh, it's myself and uh, our creative director, Natasha Sakos. He's going to be, uh, she's our creative director right now. So we're putting on a show called Six Impossible Things. Mm, nice. It is a metaphor using uh, fairy tale objects in real life and how uh, me as a magician have, have spent my life finding these impossible things. Oh, that's fascinating. We'll be starting that at, um, that'll be going on. We'll have ticket sales available on the website, inkedmagician.com. Uh, inked, we like to point that out, inked, like tattoo, yes. inked, magician, the or just remyconnor.com, both work. Okay. Uh, we will also be in the middle of our Haunted Havana run. I'm running a Haunted Illegal Casino. It's a 30-minute show that goes on about eight times, or eight to ten times an evening, where I run a, where I perform as the devil at the card table doing an entire performance about card cheats and con men and oh that. that's fascinating so that'll be a seven week run so that's going to be down in the fort lauderdale area yeah or? that'll be that will be in miami springs miami springs okay and then our uh, six impossible things you'll just have to figure out where they are one of the key things to it is uh we're not telling people where the shows are the oh. show is going to be constantly moving venues, so you'll have to pick your date, and then we'll give you the location when it comes closer to the date. So you got to go to your website to see when it's going to be, huh? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, we're doing. Um, you know, part of the six impossible things is traveling around the country finding them. Oh, so, so it's like a treasure hunt kind of thing. Uh, well, for me, it's the, for me, it's a treasure hunt for the audiences. They get to buy a ticket, come into the show and see the objects that I have found. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Well, that's, I love that. I love that. Well, (laughs) I definitely, I hope that I can make one of your shows. (laughs) That would be great. I need to make it down to Fort Lauderdale sometime. That's for sure. Yeah. Come on down. And, and if you come to the Atlanta area, you better, son. I will. Contact me. I will. You're, how far are you from Atlanta now? I'm like an hour. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're just far enough away that, you know, we don't have to deal with Atlanta and traffic and all that stuff. But, you know, if there's something going on, we can come in and, yeah, you can just come stay with us. That'd be great. <laughs> 
what would what was your happy hack? I know you have lots of them, but what was oh, the one man. you wanted to bring up? Uh, let's see. I have I have several different happy hacks. Most of them are just reminders, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's usually just things of like, um, for instance, right before I walk on stage, you know, I remind myself, you love what you do. Yeah. You know, like that's that's an important thing. So if I were to say like having a happy hack, once you start analyzing the situations that you're in, the things that you need to fix, the, the moments that trigger you, once you start acknowledging those, you'll start to come up with little the phrases or, or things that you can say to remind yourself of that like, this is okay. This is not bad. This is a way to, to be happy. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the biggest things is, is choosing you know, realizing that you can choose to be happy. Oh, that is so huge because you know, it like, is our responsibility or yeah. it's our sole responsibility to make ourselves happy. It's not. And it's okay to not always be happy. Yeah. Like that's okay. Like if you were always happy, then you would never be happy because that would be normal. There's no contrast. Right. Right. So like it, they're allowed to be there. It's okay. Well, it's like, you know, just eating different kinds of foods you know mm -hmm. it's like you can't have dessert 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 you know eventually you're gonna need a steak you gotta have like some of the other things and they go oh i'd really like to have some you know some dessert you know mm -hmm. that's just you know joy but you know obviously what i'm talking about as far as happiness is that you're you're eating a healthy menu most of the time right you know and then you get little perks of joy and and then you might you might eat something that's like oh i don't like liver <laughs> but you don't blame the liver you're just like i just had that experience and i just didn't like it you know, you know i I'm think also like, part of the you know be upset that i've had liver and and that was such a horrible experience <laughs> You know what it is? But here's the thing, though. With more knowledge, right? You say to yourself, I don't like liver. I'm 35 years old. I don't like liver. Mm -hmm. But when I'm 42, I know that I could like liver now. Maybe. Yeah. Right? So it's, you know, reminding yourself, oh, things change sometimes, too. Well, um, for I have an example of that. Um, my mother used to make me eat one pea for however old I was. Until I was 18, I said, mother, do I have to eat 18 peas? And she realized, well, I'm an adult. I don't have to eat peas anymore. Well, now I like peas. <laughs> but I Sweet think I this. didn't like them because she made me eat them. You know, but now that I don't have to be made to eat them, I love them. <laughs> For me, <laughs> sweet potato. Hated sweet potato growing up until I was like maybe 30. And then suddenly I was like, this is, this is it. This is potatoes. Yeah. And not yeah. so bad after all. Yeah. Not so bad. I can I can actually eat them now without anything on them. So yeah. But um, well, Remy, it has been wonderful to talk to you. And I, you. I really have to make a point to come down to Fort Lauderdale area and see yeah, you. Yeah, a lot of people down here that miss you. I know. I know. And and definitely please come to Atlanta. I you'd probably I want to. find all sorts of um places to Hey, if you've got any place that are looking for a show up there, I'd love to come up. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um and uh yeah, it's actually, you know, there I would like to put together um something. I mean, I've got people who are singers and mm -hmm. you know put something together that you can have a uh, great meditation party yes yes people who yeah yeah we should do that um yeah because i wanted to put together something where you know everybody has a little bit to bring to it but mm -hmm. we're all on the same page you know what i mean you know i did one of those dinners it was uh called the thought leaders dinner we mm -hmm. all came in uh we made dinner together Right. So it was a yeah. group of like 12 people all made dinner together. Nobody knew each other. Uh -huh. And there were two rules. We cannot give our real name and we cannot give our real job. Oh, really? Yeah, to spend the entire night. And then at the end of the night, we all guessed what the other people did for a living. One person guessed name and job. 
Really? Oh, wow. That'd be, that'd be crazy. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Well, um, I would love to have you on again. I think we have so much more to talk about. There's, it's, it's a very big topic that can constantly be unpacked. Definitely, for sure. I mean, we could talk again in a week and we could say, look, everything I said last week was all bull. <laughs> Just ignore <laughs> that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's the thing is that you just can't take it too seriously. It's all about fun. And um, you ever watch the show New Girl? I have a long time ago when it first came out. There is a great quote from Jamie Lee Curtis. She says, Jess, it's just life. You can't take it too seriously. Yeah. And, and to some people, it's just an illusion. It is. Right? It is. Right. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. And again, I love you. I miss you. you. And I can't wait to see you again. And thank you again for coming. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye now. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Create Happy Now podcast. Please be sure to subscribe. And if you are watching on YouTube, hit that notification bell. If you have a topic to suggest, please leave a comment below. Catch the Create Happy Now podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Audible, iHeartRadio, Player FM, Listen Notes, and Podchaser. Check out other YouTube videos on the Create Happy Now YouTube channel. And if you want more, check down below for resources, courses, and events, or go to www.createhappynow.com.